Welcome to the Equal Opportunities Committee, the 11th meeting of 2014. Please set any electronic devices to flight mode or off. Today's first agenda item is an update from the Equality and Human Rights Commission, the EHRC. You agreed to seek an update from the EHRC in a range of policy areas. In Paper 1, members will see that a response was received last week. I would also flag up that we sought information on EHRC reforms from stakeholders in 2013, and any further work should take these views into account. The current EHRC response could be used to feed into your work programme considerations later this year, particularly on the public sector equality duty and the EHRC's business plan. You will also see that the EHRC is to publish its annual report and accounts for 2013-14 later in the summer. If you would like to hear formal evidence, we could either programme an evidence session with them in September or October, or hold an additional meeting in August. Can I see your agreement on which approach we should take, please, from everyone? Siobhan? Um, I think September or October would be a good time once mm -hmm. um, they've published some more evidence and, and some of the things mm -hmm. that they've detailed, particularly around Gypsy Travellers as well, um, would, would be quite interesting. So I think maybe waiting until then would, would be good, but definitely an evidence session um, would be helpful. Okay. John? Yeah, I, think, I, mean, I, I agree entirely with Siobhan. I, I wonder, though, in the interim, it, and, and in line with the other work that's been done by the committee, if could we be possible to get the parameters of the uh, research they're doing in to Gypsy Traveller accommodation at this time, please. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else have any comments? Christian? Yeah, we want to make sure that we get the research before, before we have the yes, meeting. That's yeah, the most important okay. thing. I so, have time to study it. Yeah. So, have we all agreed then that we will look at September, October to have this meeting? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I now need to suspend the meeting just now while we wait on our. Uh, next session to start, we're waiting on some uh, witnesses to come along and give some evidence. So the meeting will be suspended until then. Thank you.
Good morning again, everyone. Um, we're now going to move on to our second item of business, which is an evidence session on female genital mutilation. Can I just remind everyone again that's just come in to switch off any electronic devices that you may have, please? We'll start the session with some introductions. Um, at the table, we have our clerking and research team, official reporters and broadcasting services. And around the room, we're supported by the security office and also welcome to the observers in the public gallery. My name is Margaret McCulloch and I'm the committee's convener. And I'm now going to invite members and witnesses to introduce themselves in turn uh, by starting on my right. And can I also ask the witnesses when you're introducing yourself, just give a wee introduction about the organisation and any other information you may feel that's relevant. Thank you very much. I'm Marco Biaggi. I'm the Deputy Convener and I am the MSP for Edinburgh Central. Good morning. Uh, good morning. John Finney, MSP Highlands and Islands. Good morning. Christian Arad, a uh, member of the Parliament for the North East of Scotland. Hi, Paul McMahon, MSP Central Scotland. Alec Johnston, member from North East Scotland. And John Mason, MSP for Glasgow Shettleston. Gillian Smith, I'm the Director of the Royal College of Midwives in Scotland. And the Royal College of Midwives are part of the intercollegiate uh, guidelines and recommendations that were launched in uh, Westminster Parliament. I'm particularly committed to this issue and uh, engaged in the Scottish, working, Scottish Government Working Group around uh, FGM and how we take some of the recommendations forward. And also, I newly appointed, are newly starting to be with the National FGM Charity Group that's there. So it's and in my time working overseas in the Sultanate of Oman, I experienced it on an almost daily basis. So I have considerable understanding of the issues around it. Good morning. My name is Jim Doyle. I work for Glasgow City Council. My job title is Quality Improvement Officer, but my strategic remit is Child Protection. And basically that involves working with other partners, the other services like social work, health, from the voluntary sector, Bernardo's and people like that, to do with, to do with uh, any issue to do with child protection. Um, one of the biggest part of my job is to make sure that all of the 300 and odd uh, child protection coordinators in the school uh, receive annual training and, and biannual training actually on, on anything relevant and that, that, that children are protected. Good morning, my name is Dr Kate Darlow. Um, I'm a senior registrar in obstetrics and gynaecology, so I'm a frontline health worker um, based in the Royal Infirmary here in Edinburgh. I've been asked to represent the Scottish Committee of the Royal College of Obs and Gynae. Um, I was asked because I've got a, an interest having worked in Ethiopia and lived in Somalia, so first-hand experience. Good morning, my name is Anna Bonney. Um, I'm the uh, lead officer for Safeguarding and Education Scotland. And um, that means ensuring that Education Scotland staff have a good understanding of all matters safeguarding and also supporting um, the inspectors within schools, because that's, that's an element of our inspection work. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to hand over to Christian Allard, who is going to start by asking the, the questions and then we'll, we'll go around the, the panel in turn. OK, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I've got a few questions about statistics and numbers, but first of all, maybe a, a, a question hearing what, what you said as an introduction. Uh, you talked about uh, FGM. Uh, is, is people know what FGM is, or do we need sometimes to use the female genital mutilation terms just to make sure that people understand what it means? I'd probably like to come back on that because I think it's a very good point that you make because if you spoke to women who uh, have suffered from that abuse they may not know it as the term female genital mutilation they may know it as female circumcision they may know it as sooner or they may know it as something else that they, they know from their country so they may not because of their culture see it as mutilation and so I, I think often that what we've not got right and I think it's a great question to ask what we've not got right is the terminology when we ask women if they have been subjected to that a form of abuse. Mm -hmm. Would anybody else like to come in on that? 
Anna, yes. in, in a, a recent letter in February 2014 that went to every school, the terminology we used was female genital mutilation. That was a, um, a letter that was signed by uh, the CAPSEC, Michael Russell and um, Shona Robinson. Um, so that was the, the terminology we used at that stage, but um, we're you know, very open to um, getting the terminology right. Um, um, could I just ask the witnesses if you want to come in in any of the questions, just to indicate to myself or my clerk in my left-hand side. Okay. Thank you. Christian? Uh, if I can follow up on statistics and, and, and numbers, uh, we, we got some, uh, some conflict evidence given to us. Some people attach more importance to statistics and numbers and others didn't. One particularly said, but it's not a matter uh, of numbers, but a matter of need. And if one child is affected, that is one too many. So I would like to have your views on, first of all, have you got any idea of the numbers of women and girls who have been subjected to FGM and the number of girls who are under threat from FGM? Dr. Davis? I think um, we don't entirely know. Um, and hopefully once we get the report from the Scottish Refugee Council, then we'll be able to understand better. Um, but I think there is increased awareness, which is helping to generate more services for people and then hopefully when there is more access to these services we'll be able to understand exactly what it is that we need to offer. Jillian? I think just building on that is that I think that the statistics that we have of the women who have had this procedure carried out are woefully inadequate. And what we do have is we've got the Scottish Women Held Maternity Record, which is often the first time that we, that we know about it or encounter it. And every midwife is obliged under what's in the Scottish Women Held Maternity Records to ask the question. However, to extrapolate that information is very difficult when we do not have an electronic maternity record. And I have been plugging for this for some time because if we were to do it retrospectively and you were to go through 58,000 uh, maternity records in Scotland to extrapolate that information, it's a real challenge. Whereas if we had that information on an electronic system, it would be there and it would be readily available. So I don't think that the statistics that were given, whether it's in our uh, intercollegiate guidelines recommendations or not, I think that they are woefully inadequate because I don't think we'd know the real, um, th what the real challenge is here. Can I come in and, uh, and ask a basic question about why isn't there an electronic system for it? And I think it's a finance issue. Mm -hmm. And uh, to get that electronic patient record, and there are some areas, to be fair, which have done that around maternity services, and Lothian is one of them. Ayrshire and Arns and other. Glasgow is currently looking at it. And as we know, Glasgow is a, a major area because it was a dispersal area for asylum seekers. And so it would be really good to have that kind of information in an electronic basis. I think there are also challenges, and I have to take this from my own profession, that the question is there to be asked. And I'm not, and some of the um, feedback we've had from organisations such as DARF is that I'm not entirely sure that midwives are always asking that question because of cultural sensitivities. When they, and I think we have to park cultural sensitivities. When, we, uh, when they do their booking in. So I think or it's perhaps the terminology of how they're asking the question, but I do think that that is a piece of work that we require to do around it. Anybody else like to come in on that question? No? Kate? Just to add that, um, as Gillian said, we do have an electronic system in NHS Lothian, so we are considering the possibility of a service evaluation because there is some information that we can access there. Um, we have a question which is asked to all the women at booking where we can tick that in the, um, on our computer system. So we have the potential to be able to look back at that, but that's something that we're just um, considering at the moment. Thank you very much for your answer. Is, should gathering data be a priority? And, uh, should it, and, and I think you, you touched on it. Uh, is, is there's not going to be a problem with relationship with certain communities if we if we uh, search too much for, for gathering data as opposed maybe uh, to see uh, what what's the best way to uh, to address FGM? Yeah, I think 
think it's difficult if you don't gather the data to have an idea of what your benchmark is and what the size of the, the matter that we have to deal with is. And where resources are tight within, whether it's education, health, justice, whatever it is, if we don't know when we're making a case to have resources put behind something, what the real issue is, then it is very difficult. I don't think it takes away from your initial comment of one child is one child too many. So it doesn't take away from that initial comment. But if you are looking to see how you plan a service, and we're currently sitting in Scotland with only one midwife a, which is allocated to, a, and it's an asylum-seeking community, but deals a lot around FGM, and that's in Glasgow. And that's because we don't know the scale of the issue. And if we don't have the data, we don't know it, how do you channel your resources into that, that way? So I think that's my reasoning for data. Anybody else? Um, to John Finney now. Hey, thank you, Kabina. Uh, panel, uh, it's important to bring about attitudinal change. And do you have views about how we would engage with communities to do that? I appreciate it's a very challenging issue, but do you have views on that? I'd like to start. Yes, I'm happy to start. Um, I, I suppose we're looking at, um, I don't know whether there's attitudinal change where teachers are concerned, but certainly raising awareness um, that we, we have this letter that's gone to um, all schools and authorities and um, making them aware of, um, of the concerns that um, Scotland has about f uh, female genital mutilation. And that will be followed up. Um, every teacher in Scotland um, at the beginning, it's usually in the August, uh, some authorities vary, but they do it um, on a very regular basis. Um, they provide um, an update to all teaching staff on issues of safeguarding child protection and female genital mutilation is, is such an aspect. So we are preparing with partners um, some additional information that will go to every um, teacher. So I think that's awareness raising and um, being more sensitive to the issues, which uh, will certainly help uh, community awareness. Just, just working along those lines, we're working with Anna on that. I'm one of a, a group that's working and putting those guidelines together, the, the presentation for August for staff. When I'm doing my, my training with CP coordinators, um, we do them twice a year. We do one in November, one in May, um, and the May round has just finished. And each one of those, I brought the subject up just at a very, very high level. Um, and the reaction from, from the audience, from all of the teachers, was they were certainly concerned about it and, and they needed some more information, but it's a question of sensitivity and, and how much information they need. Um, but what we were emphasising to staff is it's a child protection issue. First and foremost, it's a child protection issue. Um, and we follow child protection procedures. Um, in terms of attitudinal change, I think I think staff or teachers are are always prepared to protect children, whether it's FGM or, or something else. But they need they need slightly more information about FGM. I would say. When you say they need more information, what information do they need, and who should it come from? I think I think. Child protection coordinators need to know and, and staff need to know what, what the issues are. And, and if you're a teacher in a classroom, you would need to know, or a head teacher, for example, um, if there was a possibility that a child was going to be operated upon because of that, taken away. Uh, and the information they need is to look out for the, the sort of signs for that. And similarly, if, if they find a child, if they think a child has had this procedure carried out, um, they need to know what to do and what to look out for. That sort of information. I mean, I think that the fact that we're here today, and I was sharing my card on the way up in the lift, because I think that we need to work more collaboratively. And I think it's interesting what Jim says around it, because uh, that's the kind of issue that I think it would be good for midwives to go into school and talk about. I think, I'm, and, I, and I think it's that close working together. Some of the work that we're now picking up with the Scottish Refugee Council, I, I met yesterday with NSPCC, all of these areas, it's that collaborative working. And uh, the work that the Scottish Government Group are still look, are looking at now to bring those groups together, it's only if we work to, together that we'll deal with some of these. But an interesting aspect of it is that this is generally carried out by the communities of women 
on the girls. And what I think we need to do, and it's perhaps an influencing area, is in influencing the imams to turn around the change in this, or influencing the religious leaders, depending on where that is. And, and that's how you influence the communities. And so we need to work with them as well. Before you move on, I think, can I bring Mark on on that just now, and then back to you, John? I was just intrigued, Mr Doyle, by your discussion of, of this having come up in a, a context where there were a lot of teachers. Were, were there any examples of people feeding back with specific concerns? You know, did it, anybody say that uh, rings a bell with me? I've got possible... Uh, I, I, I'm suspicious. Or, or was it the case that people were completely lacking in information at that stage? They weren't completely lacking. They were they're certainly they were aware there was an issue generally. Um, I didn't get any specific examples of, of, of cases having <coughs> taken place, but it's something that I think the teaching profession are becoming more aware of, like the general public, probably. John? I'm going to say something that's not meant as a criticism of any of you. I've had a look at your designations, and, and the question maybe is a bit unfair, but it does seem that you're talking with each other, we are, um, and, and that's to be commended. But also the, uh, the issue of engagement with the... Who are you talking to that's talking to the communities, if you follow? Please. <laughs> and I suppose, and if I take it from the Royal College of Midwives, we're working with a, a number of these groups. And I can, I, I can say that, that a number of the groups, eh, I've already had some conversations with DARF and some of the other groups. And I, and I think you're right, because usually these groups that, you, that are there... Are uh, they're already you're you're preaching to the converted because they understand it, but we need to see how we can get in and around around those communities, and I think that is the real challenge to do that. We are sorry, didn't put my hand up. <laughs> um, the, the the city council education services we sit on the Glasgow Violence Against Women group, and they work with the community. Mm -hmm. And we also work with the Women's Support Project uh, fairly closely at the moment on, on FGM specifically. Um, so, and, and they link with the community and they've got a, a role there. Yeah, just to really carry on from that, I mean, uh, when Jim mentioned child protection, as, as did I, and that's a multi-agency um, process that's well embedded uh, in all local authorities and in all the <coughs> schools in Scotland. Um, and they, they engaged considerably with their parental community. But authorities where there are particular worries or concern, as Jim's been outlining, go much further than that. And we know very good relationships and fact-finding and uh, working with partners to make sure their staff have the, the information that they're required. And also to talk to communities about how to, how to move forward. So there are a number of good examples of, of engaging further. Would you maybe like to comment as well? Said, um, Dr Alison Scott, who's based here in Edinburgh, she would have liked to have been here today but, but couldn't. Um, she's been working very closely. She sits on the Scottish Government Group, um, so she has a strong inter interest from our side. You're sure, and, and, and I think there's a benefit in a, an unequivocal statement that this is child abuse um, and um, that perhaps can be a double-edged sword too. And brings me on to my next question, which is the balance between, if you like, education and enforcement, because whilst there might seem to be a great attraction in having a significant penalty associated with someone perpetrating these acts, maybe that has a negative effect in some communities too. Do you have a view on that at all, please? Julian? Well, I'm almost hogging it now. <laughs> but I, I think that that's a big issue. And a, when we get them when they're pregnant, and I'm sure Kate has the same issues, they're very vulnerable. And often that there is the a concern a, around how a, you don't want to over-egg the pudding and have them stop coming from maternity care because you've put so much emphasis around that. And I think that's the real difficulty with a, a number of these things. is a, 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 And that will be the sensitivity about how we deal with this. But when some people use the label of it's culturally sensitive, uh, for me, I don't think we can afford to have that label anymore. I think the sensitivity is around do we prevent them from seeking help from us in the future? And if you look back at some of the confidential inquiries into maternal death, 
they will tell you that women from a migrant immigrant populations are less likely to seek help and some of that help you worry is that because um, of those types of sensitivities and I, I think we need to know how we're going to deal with that in the future because if we we know it's child abuse and if we highlight these the, the female children of women who come from these communities and we know that because of the women who've already been subjected to it themselves is um, how do we how do we deal with that and how do we take that forward once they know they're going to perhaps be put on uh, the children's at-risk register. So I think that's a huge challenge for all of the departments of health across the UK. I've forgotten the thrust of your question, Mr Finney, I'm sorry. Well, it, it is the balance, if you like, between um, education, education and enforcement, if you like. I think our role in it is very much... Uh, child protection and it's, it's, it's awareness raising with staff so that they know if there's a concern which procedures to follow and as an interagency procedure where it would go to social work and the police to investigate. Um, we've always got to be very careful of, of our relationships with, with our parents but I think we're fairly skilled in schools at doing that. Agreeing, agreeing with Jim, I think, I, think, I think that's right and I think also um, Teachers are very clear they have a duty to raise any concern that they have about any child that they're teaching. Um, they're not necessarily the decision makers, um, that there's a due process that they go through, but that is very well embedded in Scotland. Um, but I think there's other things um, like um, how we relate to our pupil community as well, um, and um, the, these, these guiding, guidelines for raising awareness for teachers have to come first. Um, but Education Scotland, again, with other partners, are looking to uh, develop maybe some curricular materials. So. Uh, that young people can be made more aware in a very sensitive manner, which is why we'll need um, a, a lot of experts to, to support this work, um, these issues, and they can begin to explore them um, within the educational context. Okay, would you like to come in? And then John Mason would like to ask a supplementary. Okay. Yeah. I just to, to agree with Gillian that as clinicians, we feel that we really need to support women rather than criminalise them. We want them to be able to feel comfortable that they can disclose that they've had FGM done in the past so that we, we can then tailor the care that we offer them. We don't want them to be going underground and, and then for us to discover that they've had FGM when they're in labour, that's not a very helpful time to find it out. So we need to, to empower these women to feel comfortable to, um, to disclose this information to us. Um, I mean, it was this kind of issue of being culturally sensitive, and maybe I picked up Ms Smith wrongly. Did you say at one stage park cultural sensitivities? Um, because, I mean, it seems to me, I've lived in Asia as well, and, you know, we in the West, I mean, we're obviously used to our kind of society, but we talk about things, especially anything to do with the sexual realm, in a much more open way. And other, you know, other cultures would be quite critical of us for doing that, for not being a little bit more modest and a little bit more sensitive and these kind of things. <laughs> And I just wonder how we get we strike that balance. And I think it's uh, and I think what I'm seeing is part cultural sensitivities on this issue because it is child abuse. I mean, there's no other way that we can look at this. It is child abuse, and it's uh, and generally of the, uh, the age that it's done, there is no consent around this. The girls think that they're going off for a nice party before they're pinned down, and this is done to them. And that's when I say we can't afford to say, well, we'll not discuss that issue because it's culturally sensitive. And I think that's where I mean around the cultural sensitivities. We have to discuss the issue, we have to deal with the issue, and we have to put a stop to this child abuse. And I totally agree with that, but I mean, would you say then that the, the way you would talk to somebody from a different culture would be different? I mean, I think, I think part of that's the language as well and their understanding. <clears throat> and when I was describing earlier on where you wouldn't necessarily say female genital mutilation because they may not understand it as mutilation, then that's the kind of thing when you're being culturally sensitive about how you raise, raise those issues. That's what I mean about that's when you use your cultural sensitivities. And, but the issue itself can't just say, well, we'll not deal with it because it's culturally sensitive. So I think I hope that uh, describes what I meant by that. Thank you. Martha? 
I wonder, uh, part of the issue of this is about public awareness, and um, there has been a bit of public awareness in the last uh, week or so connected with the deportation of a Nigerian woman with two young children, which I, I personally found shameful. Do, do you think that particular instance will help um, address the problem in Scotland or hinder it in any way? I think really um, in terms of public awareness there's been a growing attention since January that, I, that I've become more aware of and there's been a number of incidents, um, a letter to schools here and, and, and also um, in other places in the UK. So I think that people are more aware and there's been a big focus just on, on women um, in terms of education. So that there seems to have been over the last while um, the, the whole issue of, uh, of um, women and inequality um, and human rights with regard to women um, being explored. So I think it's a, it's a very good time um, for us to explore this issue um, because I think it's more in the public um, mind than it has been in the past um, and, and to become clearer about how we're going forward with it. Kate, would you like to comment? Yeah, I, I think that raising, <coughs> raising public awareness can only help the situation. Um, we know from the DARF study that FATU showed that women were disappointed if they weren't asked about it antenatally. So if we're raising awareness from both sides, women expect the question to be asked. Um, and also the um, health personnel are quite used to the, the concept as well. Dawn, you okay now? Well, I, 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 can I reassure the panel, I'm not seeking to embroil them in some sort of constitutional issue. I just wonder if they felt that this was in any way beneficial on one level that the issue has been raised, but the perception is that it having been raised, nonetheless, the authorities, whoever the authorities are, have disregarded it and um, someone has been deported. Gillian, I think there's absolutely no doubt that because on a daily basis through my organisation I get all of the media reports that's, and, and a... Since probably the launch of the intercollegiate guidelines, this has just taken off. I was talking to my colleagues from the Scottish Refugee Council outside earlier on, and I was saying the International Congress of Midwives is on in a Prague and has been on all week. And on a day and daily basis, that is what's being on, uh, has been on Twitter. It's about FGM. There's been huge workshops about it. There's been a recognition in some of the countries overseas that they are reducing the amount of FGM. And we perhaps need to take some le lessons from that. So I know that my colleagues in the Royal College of Midwives have been heavily involved in that uh, work in Prague this week. So to see what comes out from that, certainly as an organisation, we are really interested, but it has been Twitter mad all week about it. Perhaps to move away from the, the midwife parent interaction, one of the concerns that was raised before by our previous panel was that a strong criminalisation approach would make it very hard for family members or the children at risk themselves to come forward or, or to raise a suspicion because it would involve criminalising a close relative. What are your views on that, especially, Mr Doyle and Ms Boney, the, the ones that are, are dealing with it from a, a safeguarding approach? Would you agree with that, or is there a balance to be struck there? There's a balance to be struck, and I, I, think, I think it comes back to sensitivity and, 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 and knowing what you're dealing with and knowing, knowing your community. I think that's really important, because if you... If you if you focus so much on the criminalisation aspect, you change your role. Your role is child protection. It's not law enforcement. That, may, that might sound contradictory. Um, obviously, you want to enforce the law, but you have to make sure that children feel safe and are safe, and the families feel safe and are safe. And the analogy, the analogy in my head, mm -hmm. just to get back slightly to the last question about about public awareness, is that I do a lot of work around about child sexual exploitation, and and one of the big factors there is publicity around about the U-Tree operation, Jimmy Savile, and all the other stuff that's happened around about that. And it is a kind of mixed blessing, but there are more and more referrals and more and more public awareness, and people are much more likely to come forward now to talk about that kind of issue. And it's probably, it's probably similar for FGM, but there's a there's a, an added level of sensitivity because of the, the communities you're dealing with and their own perception of the procedure. And I think talking a gradual process and of awareness and then education... I was about to draw a similar parallel myself because presumably in 
safeguarding and child protection, there are already going to be instances where a child's reports are going to lead to potential prosecution of, of parents. I mean, how, how do you handle that? How, how can you address that and get over that difficulty? Is that something that is just going to be present? I think the, from, from a teacher point of view, the duty of care overrides all of that and that they're concerned about the, the child for whatever reason within their class. And then due process takes place. So then there are discussions with health colleagues, social work colleagues, and we can bring in other people and it's, it's how that is then progressed. And there are opportunities for discussions and, 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 and thoughts. So it, it's, it's not a sort of a, a brutal process. I think we've, we've learned um, through various other child protection issues that, you, that there's got to be good data gathering good exploration, good dialogue with the families um, in, in, in this process and, uh, and people who are involved in child protection have gained those skills. This is perhaps for, for some people a newer area to consider and um, though there has to be further re reflection and training on it but I think the process is, is already probing but appropriately sensitive. Um, Alex, can I pass on to you now, please? Um, just a couple of questions that uh, cover the background of your uh, views. The Scottish Government guidance on child protection, um, in general terms, does it specifically give you uh, enough on FGM to work on within child protection? Kate, do you like to answer first, please? Can you expand on your question? The, basically, the, the Scottish Government's guidance on child protection, does it specifically, uh, the, specifically the section on FGM, is it sufficient for your needs? I think um, we're still really understanding exactly what we need to do in these circumstances. Obviously, I'm dealing normally more with the, the mothers who are presenting in pregnancy and um, we need to understand best how to make sure that we're sensitively referring them either to health visitors or whether that be social work and I don't think we're fully on agreement on what the best approach is because we don't want to criminalise these women um, and, I, and my understanding is that there's some disagreement between the intercollegiate report that's been written um, and from the Scottish side, whether we take on all of the advice there um, and go with quite such a heavy-handed approach. So I don't think that we've fully decided on that yet. Um, the, yes, the, the um, guidance was refreshed uh, in May 2014, and it does have um, a page and a half of information about female genital mutilation. Um, ba basically, um, it... it it is, um, and taking, taking your point, basically it, um, the guidance outlines um, the areas that this can happen in, um, the justifications um, for female genital mutilation. It then goes on um, to talk about um, the ways children might leave school or they might come back uncomfortable. So it gives the beginning, though teachers... Um, um, Detection would be would not be a role for teachers. They could be sensitive to children's change, but you know, in terms of the physical aspect, couldn't get involved in that. Um, so, so they're very clear. It also offers further advice um, in terms of uh, forward as an organisation. It, it quotes UNICEF um, and also quotes the legislation of 2005, which make it a prohibition. So it, it covers a number of things. Um, but the fact that it has been refreshed, um, uh, um, you know, suggests that these things. Um, this document can, the guidance can change and respond to requirements. I wasn't personally involved in this, as, uh, in, in this but um, certainly know that uh, um, schools have found it helpful. Gillian? Um, I, I, I'm not entirely sure that it does, to answer that question. I think that we, we've got a lot of initiatives at the press at the moment, whether it's the early years collaborative, getting it right for every child, whether it's the uh, Children and Young People's Bill and the named individual. 
And when I was I was talking yesterday to representatives from the GERFEC team at NHS Education Scotland, and I was saying that the part that they mustn't forget to put in that, because I think it's really important, especially around the named individual, is female genital mutilation. And it's got to be part of getting it right for every child. So we need to make sure, and that's why uh, we're certainly working with the Maternity and Children Quality Improvement Collaborative to make sure it's somewhere in there. So I'm not sure at the moment that they've got it right, but I think we're, we're at the start of a journey on how to change things. And it's probably raising the awareness to make sure that anything that comes out has that somewhere and is involved in it. I think we have to, to disagree. GERFIC is about getting it right for every child and it covers all aspects. Um, and and, and uh, child protection is one, one model um, of that, but um, we have um, very strong pastoral care in our schools in Scotland going from early years all the way through. Um, and we have staff who deal with all sorts of issues within the school and getting it right for, for uh, every child deals with all manner of issues that a child walks this, through the school with. Um, so the child protection is um, one aspect of getting it right, one, one aspect of uh, the additional support for learning, uh, and one aspect for the other legislation that was mentioned. I just really want to clarify on that. I didn't mean it should be the sole part of it, but I meant it shouldn't be ignored as part of it. I, I, would, I, I wouldn't see it being no. <laughs> ignored, <laughs> because then we wouldn't be getting it right for every child. To reflect on what Anna has said, that, that our training in August for, for all staff, and that includes non-teaching staff, if there's such a thing as non-teaching staff, because you can't be a non-teacher, I should have said support staff. Uh, our, our training in August is to, is to in, embed child protection as part of the, the GERFEC approach, the getting it right approach, and, and that is actually what most teachers do instinctively. Okay, do you have any comments to make on the question? Okay, I think, uh, Alex, you... Finished. The one other thing I was going to ask, and uh, to touch on what uh, Jim Doyle mentioned, uh, the issue of training. Uh, <laughs> do you feel that, uh, well, uh, what level of training do you, people who share your uh, professional responsibilities tend to have in FGM? Is it uh, something which you do receive training on, or is it something that uh, where your experience simply evolves as it goes along? Training <coughs> is, is, is collaborating with other agencies and then learning from them. Um, and, and to get back to the, the child protection issue, that although the issue itself may, be, may present itself differently, the, the procedures and, and the concerns and the, all the other things are the same. But in terms of, of FGM itself, um, I've had no formal training. I go for the other professions. <laughs> um, as, as obstetricians, we're um, given formal training in FGM. And that's um, noticeably recently increased, so our, it's been added into our core training so that all um, doctors have to have um, attended a session on it. Um, and that just means that if I any women are seen, then we're all in understanding of different types of FGM and what their needs are. But we do also recognise, and it's part of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gyne Gynaecologists Green Top Guideline, that it is preferable that there is still a a named person in each unit that these women can receive more expert care from and have much more of a first-hand experience. Um, and then obviously all of our other colleagues and midwives as well should be receiving the same sort of training. Gillian? It will talk, be talked about within the midwifery curriculum. And, but I, I, I think now that we have a, a challenge to raise that awareness because our society is becoming more multicultural. And that a multicultural, a, there's a spread in it. So that might be when you look at some of the more remote areas that it, you don't see quite as much as you do as you see in Glasgow or you see in Edinburgh and in or Aberdeen or places like that. So I think that we certainly have to make sure that a, there's a little bit more emphasis around it than that is just in the student midwifery curriculum. And it's perhaps it's something that we need to look at post doing a wee bit more continuing professional development around. And I think there are a number of groups who are looking at that. Can I just bring Mark in on that? Just now, yes, Alex? you referred to your own specialisms. Do you know if paediatricians and GPs receive similar training? 
Institute. I know that they can access it through choice, but I don't know if it's a requirement. I couldn't comment on the general practitioners, but I'm fairly sure that it, it, it probably features quite strongly in the paediatricians, not perhaps so much the neonatal paediatricians, but paediatricians. So you've finished yet. Can we pass you on to John Mason now? Uh, thank you. Um, I mean, my area of interest was kind of around resources, perhaps because I'm on the Finance Committee. Um, but, uh, I mean, one thing I was interested in was the fact that the name person was mentioned just now. And um, so, I mean, I'm wondering, if we're taking this forward, are we needing more resources, or is it more just a question of the current midwives, GPs, everybody else uh, being more aware, being better trained, that kind of thing? Or you did, uh, Miss Smith, you mentioned already there was just one dedicated midwife. I mean, are, I mean, are we needing 20 dedicated midwives, or are we not at that stage yet? And I think that's an interesting question because it goes back to what I said before. Until we have the statistics, you don't really know what the issue is. And, and anybody who's looking at how they build the resources within a health board and how they put them out, out there really needs to know what is the size of the issue. Could you do this across a, a regional basis so that there's somebody there who can give specific advice? And I'm only looking for a, the midwifery side of things because, as Kate says, there should be somebody in every unit who has a particular interest in it, the obstetric and gynaecology side of things. And I think that it, it's, looking, it's looking to see whether that is the issue. I think we do need more awareness raised and, and, and more training. I think that the group because we have the women, we have them antenatally, so there we have some um, opportunities around education then. What we do is we have the women for around about 10 days before we discharge them into the care of the health visitor. So I think the health visitors are probably a, a really, they're probably quite a, a good group that, that I'm not sure whether you've already spoken to the health visitor community or the Royal College of Nursing community because they will be in the Royal College of Nurses will be in the accident emergency departments, paediatric departments. So that might be some area where um, you want to take some evidence from. But I think for us, we have them for a relatively small period of time. It might run to 28 days or it might run to six weeks, depending whether there are particular issues. But um, I see our role as perhaps raising the flag to say that this female child comes from a community which may put them at risk. So, I mean, if, you, if I was asking you what was your top ask be from a kind of resources point of view, is it going back to your previous point, it's about data, it's about yeah. making more things uh -huh. on electronic records, all that kind of area? Yeah. And there's somewhere where we need to start the child health record by highlighting that this is a female child of a mother who has had this uh, carried out on her, so that you can actually start that child health record from knowing that this is a flag that you need to keep an eye on. And that's not stigmatising, is it? Uh, I wouldn't say it's stigmatising. Okay. I would say it's a flag. I mean, how else? I, I mean, this is my difficulty in knowing how else are you going to start mm. that record? How are we? How are you going to know? How am I going to, as a midwife, pass on to the health visitor that this woman has had female genital mutilation carried out? She's had a female child, and her child is at risk of that being carried out by the community or being taken overseas. If I don't raise that flag. How are they going to know? Ask the others about resources. I mean, is it a resources question or is it really just over time, education, training, all these kind of things? Um, I don't think it's a resource issue, particularly for education. Um, I think we have good systems so that we'll, we'll um, develop um, uh, about three or four um, slides um, initially um, for use to the thousands of teachers in August. So we've got very far reach. Um, and then on the basis of that, we'll, we'll then, as I said earlier, look at some curriculum materials. But we have to be sensitive to the stigmatisation because we could be presenting something to a class where there's one young person 
or one girl where that might be relate to directly. So that's why uh, we're not rushing into that. We, we want to take really strong advice so that we get the balance of discussing and informing with the potential of stigmatising or alienating a young person who that might be uh, something that's either happened or may happen. Um, and, and that takes us back to some of the work we did a long time ago when we were introducing the keeping safe and, and other um, child protection issues. So we'll, so we'll take that same approach. But again, um, um, you know, that, that's something that we will um, be able to uh, consider and budget for. Do you think having the named person in place in any way helps this whole process? Does it make it clearer to, say, a young person who they should speak to? I think, I think um, whatever process we put in legislation, uh, we find that young people, as well as, as um, talking to the name person or the, the, the registration teacher or the, the pastoral support teacher, go, go to the teachers they get on best with. Um, and, and that is something that all young people do. So, so we'll, we have legislation and we have other mechanisms, but young people talk to people they feel comfortable with. Jim? All I was going to say was that we also have to be sensitive when we're, we're speaking in August to all staff in schools that there may well be people in the staff who've been subjected mm -hmm. to this and who are taking a different line on it. Absolutely. So from a, the council's point of view or education in Glasgow, where you have some schools presumably where you would reckon that more kids are at risk or than other schools. I mean, have you? Uh, is it a resource issue for you, or is again it more about it's teachers' it's a, it's awareness? It's an education issue. It's, it's, yes. it's information. Are you getting teachers coming through from a, the wide variety of cultural backgrounds that we now have? Yes. Okay. And would you would you think of using some of these teachers then? I couldn't answer. I just never don't no. know because it's too early. Yes. To, in that process. Okay, Dr. Barlow, resources, not a problem. Um, I, again, I think we're in the early days. So the um, midwife in um, Glasgow that Gillian has mentioned is really just only beginning to set up her service. So it'll be interesting to see how many women she sees in the same here in Edinburgh. We're just setting up a service and trying to have a very multidisciplinary approach to it. So um, we don't really know how well utilised that service will be. Um, so we, we need to see what happens. And, and you'd be supportive of the idea of putting a bit of resource into uh, improving the record system, maybe more uh, IT? Absolutely. I think that we definitely need to do that um, across Scotland. As we said, in NHS Lothian we have that already, but we do need to work on the way that the information is gathered, um, and that would be very helpful. Um, and equally, if we make sure that every midwife is appropriately trained in FGM, then they won't miss the opportunity to feel comfortable to ask the question of the women in the beginning. Because currently the way the system is, um, you can just opt to not ask the question. And it looks like the answer is no. But if you haven't asked it, then we don't actually really know. So we do need to make sure that that opportunity isn't missed. Why are people, do you think, not asking the question? They're nervous about it? They're trying to build up relationships? I think um, not everyone thinks of it. Um, and, they, yeah, they want to build up relationships. They're not entirely comfortable with how to ask the question of a woman. Or possibly they do ask the question, but the woman doesn't understand what she's been asked. Um, we know that we need to use interpreters a lot of the time um, for women, and possibly that isn't always being done. So sometimes there are missed opportunities, and we need to work on that area a lot. Okay, thank you. Does anyone have any other questions about Siobhan? Um, just simply on best practice or good practice that we could learn from in Scotland, do any of the witnesses know of? of anything that's happening in other countries. We know uh, the committee have heard that there, there are 15 clinics for FGM in, in England mm -hmm. um, and how that works. Again, I know we're, we're waiting on stats and, and other parts of the country are establishing, um, as Dr Darlow said, their practice at the minute. But can we look at other countries? Should we be looking at other countries? Um, or should we simply be focusing on what the outcomes are at the minute for, for Scotland? Yeah, absolutely, definitely. We need to. Um, I know that the Scottish Refugee Council are including that in their study that they're doing. It'll be very interesting to see what their findings are from other European countries. Um, we'll look forward to their report. Um, we do try and um, learn from our colleagues, particularly down south, um, and some of the, the courses that I've attended have been from midwives um, and obstetricians who work down south, so we definitely need to use their experience because that's definitely something that we're lacking here. Um, so that's what we're doing at the moment. Probably I, I think Kate's right in everything that she said around about that. that I do think we need to 
um, see what's happening. And I think uh, that on this one, probably London and areas like that are further ahead than we are on it. And we have to take cognizance of some of the work. Now, that's not to say that we need necessarily, and Kate referred to earlier on, we need necessarily to go down the same path as they have with the recommendations. But we perhaps need to look and see what they've done in some of the overseas countries that has managed to reduce it significantly. And at the current moment, I'm not in the position, I'm sure there'll be a lot of just come back from the International Congress of Midwives in it, but I'm not in the position to say what they've done to reduce that. But uh, certainly, I, I mean, we'd be, we'd be very difficult to say that we stick to our own area and we don't think about some of the work that we do and um, we can look at that kind of reciprocity and see what we are taking to other countries and what they are bringing back to us. Speaking from a, an education point of view and, and, and safeguarding and child protection point of view, I, I think the systems we have in Scotland are robust and have been proven to be robust. Um, not to say that we, we, we can't learn from other people, but I think our, our structures and our, our approach are, are good. Anybody else like to comment? Uh, I agree with Jim, but it's, it's always helpful to look um, and, and benchmark your practice with other people. And in the, the developing of, of the August uh, refresh and the curriculum materials I was talking about will certainly look far and wide to get the, the best practice we can. Does anybody else have any questions you'd like to ask? No. Do the witnesses have any other comments, final comments you would like to make? No? Yes, Gillian. I would just like to say that coming from a midwifery point of view, and I'm sure Kate will, will feel the same thing, and having been around women who have been subjected to this and ha to have seen babies and young children subjected to this, I'm absolutely delighted at the way that the Scottish Government and this committee is taking it forward to look at the evidence. And I, I, think, it, I think it's probably now a start of a journey that's a, for a wee while been long overdue. That. Um, that actually concludes the public part of today's meeting and our next meeting will take place on Thursday the 19th of June which will include further oral evidence on female genital mutilation and I now suspend the meeting to move into private. Thank you very much. <laughs>